Thank you, uh, Mrs Osborne. It's a pleasure to serve under your chairmanship this morning. Good morning. Uh, Twenty years ago, uh, I was an officer in the Royal Air Force and I helped police the no-fly zone over the Kurdistan region uh, of Iraq. Operation Warden operated from Inchilik Air Base in Turkey. Aircraft from the United Kingdom, the United States, France and Turkey prevented Saddam Hussein from waging his war against Iraq's five million Kurds. During my tour, I joined coalition officers from the Military Coordination Centre in Zako, northern Iraq. We toured Kurdish villages in this spectacularly beautiful place of the world. We met village elders. We spread the word that the only aircraft flying above them were friends, not foes. Of course, we were giving a very, very warm welcome. The no-fly zone saved lives and has meant that Iraq's five million Kurds have experienced relative stability and peace since the end of the 1991 Gulf War. The Kurds, though, had suffered abysmally at the hands of Saddam Hussein, who carried out genocide against them, most notoriously at Halabja in 1988. That slaughter of 5,000 men, women and children remains the worst single incident of the use of chemical weapons against civilians. Saddam Hussein destroyed their cultural ag agricultural base. He, he raised thousands of villages and then rounded up the Kurds into concentration camps. It's estimated that around 200,000 people were killed overall. When Saddam Hussein's forces were defeated in Kuwait in 1991, the Kurds rose up, but they were set to be annihilated. A million people fled to the mountains. They called the mountains their only friends at that point. And the sight of people freezing to death during the winter months prompted the then Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, John Major, to work incredibly hard to initiate a no-fly zone with other allied forces. It saved the Kurds and it enabled them to rebuild their economy and their society into what it is today. It's a dynamic, prosperous, pluralistic, tolerant and a democratic part of a federal Iraq. Britain, though, has a mixed historical record in Kurdistan but when I recently returned to Kurdistan, I was left in no doubt about the deep affection and respect for the British and the United Kingdom. I was back in the region last summer as a guest of the Kurdistan regional government uh, via the all-party group for the Kurdistan region in Iraq. Uh, and it's good to see colleagues here today also from that all-party parliamentary group. I saw firsthand the peaceful and increasingly prosperous Erbil and its surrounding areas. And this fairly secular region sees Christians, Jews and Muslims living side by side. We even met uh, the local bishop. Over two million tourists visited the region last year. The Erbil citadel, 6,000 years old, is a fantastic building and it's the world's oldest continuously inhabited settlement and set to be a huge tourist attraction. Again, the welcome was warm and very friendly. I saw again firsthand that the Kurds are looking west. English is the second language and they speak it very well indeed. Two universities operate in English and most of the Kurds who go overseas on studies and postgraduate courses are actually choosing to come to the United Kingdom. The Kurdistan, though, of two decades ago lived hand-to-mouth, a hand-to-mouth existence. Today's Kurdistan, as I've already said, is becoming a wealthy and cosmopolitan society with a very active civil society but it's still in a transition phase from genocide and dictatorship uh, and its own civil war. 
It has very many bright leaders, uh, community leaders, and, and public servants. And we, we met many of those, and they were very, very impressive. But the practice of, of politics and administration and civil society is still fairly new uh, to this new uh, Kurdistan region. Uh, and they're having to learn new skills. They are seeking to soak up as much experience uh, and advice and expertise from various bodies, including the Westminster Foundation for Democracy. There's a, a deepening detente with Turkey, um, but we have to admit it's based on hard-headed self-interest. The export of Kurdistan's newly explored and, and vast reserves of oil and gas has overcome the decades of uh, hostility uh, and conflict. It, it's set to be a, a major gain for Turkey with a potentially positive impact on resolving the conflict with Turkish Kurds, which is also very important for the region. Uh, and it could also have great positives for European and British energy security, which we are talking about so much uh, in this house in the past months. The Kurds want British trade and investment because they value our skills, but also the quality of our goods and our services. But up till now, we have been a little bit too slow to respond to those desires and needs. Many of the members here today uh, have seen firsthand, I know, the Kurdish success story for themselves, and we, we talk about it regularly. Small and large companies universities, health bodies should go over to the Kurdistan region and they should get stuck in now. And I hope that when the minister speaks later, we have a number of desires and asks about to increase this close cooperation. And one of them for a start could be some direct flights from the United Kingdom to the Kurdistan region. When we flew there last year, we had to go on Austrian airlines via Vienna which ended up taking about seven or eight hours. But if we could get some direct flights, that would massively help. We also need a British trade envoy. It would be great if our leaders could visit Kurdistan. And it would be even better if we could invite their leaders to come here to the United Kingdom. I think it's really important that we be bolder and more positive in recognising who our friends are. And we have great opportunity to make some great new friends from the Kurdistan region. On my trip there in the summer, we spent a very emotional day at the Domiz refugee camp near the Iraq-Syrian border. Some 130,000 Syrian Kurds at that stage, and no doubt it's grown even more now, had fled the fighting in Syria. I spoke with many refugees, including many children, who continue to be educated in specially constructed schools. The Kurdistan regional government deserve praise for funding and arranging that, ha having been through their own crisis two decades earlier. So now being in a position to be able to help others is a far cry from the poverty and despair that I saw on the border with Turkey 20 years ago. This is a remarkable journey from genocide to prosperity. And today, I would like to urge the minister a much increased cooperation with the Kurds, not just for our sakes, but for theirs as well. And I have five specific things that I would like to ask the minister here. Firstly, I'd like to suggest that the UK government invites the president and prime minister of the Kurdistan region on an official visit to London to hopefully meet the Prime Minister and the Foreign Secretary. Secondly, I'd like to suggest that the British Government considers the possibility of a visit by the Foreign Secretary to the Kurdistan region, and no doubt he would receive a very, very warm welcome. Thirdly, uh, and particularly at a time when this Government is stressing the importance of overseas exports and finding new markets. I'd like to urge the UK government to appoint a UK trade envoy to the Kurdistan region. And as I said earlier, I saw an area that is becoming increasingly prosperous 
Uh, and we also met the Erbil Chamber of Commerce, uh, where lots of deals were being done. And I think there's great opportunities uh, for British companies and business people. And that would be helped by having a UK trade envoy. Fourthly, um, we would like a, a meeting or a discussion with the Home Office to discuss the, the visa uh, situation um, and how to remove obstacles that are in the way to increased cultural and commercial uh, activities with Kurdistan. And again, we spoke earlier about uh, the students that are picking the United Kingdom for their university studies and postgraduate studies, just to try and um, make sure that uh, students are encouraged to come to many of our wonderful universities, including my local university, Huddersfield University, that has students from 130 nations around the world. Uh, and fifthly, uh, in my question, of a uh, uh, series of questions of asks, I'm sure other members here will be asking other things as well. Um, I particularly, with um, Holocaust Memorial Day coming up uh, very, very soon uh, this month, um, I'd like to continue to urge the British government to formally recognise the genocide conducted against the Kurds uh, and to take full part in marking the annual Anfal Day on the 14th uh, of April. Uh, Mrs Osborne, I, I will bring my remarks to a, a close here because I know there are other members here that have experienced firsthand the Kurdistan region and have some very uh, positive uh, and well-informed um, in, input to this debate. But finally, I'd just like to say the Iraqi Kurds are back from the brink and making a real positive progress. They are helping their neighbours, and I think it's important now that the United Kingdom doesn't neglect this renaissance in the Kurdistan yeah, yeah. region. Thank you. Yeah, yeah.